won't stir it, it'll clot on it. Something burning? Here, look at what for you. Hey, hey. Look at that. Jake's specialty du jour, eggs erroneous. It's made with powdered eggs and 17 herbs and spices smuggled into this country by Tibetan monks. Ernest, I want you to cut yourself a big knock out of these eggs erroneous. No, I, I can't eat on an empty stomach. Well, of course you can. Eddie doesn't look at that rosy glow to his teeth. Come no. On. Oh, come on, Bill. No. Now, Ernest, would somebody dress like this lie to you about food? Fond as I am of Tibetan cooking, a hungry lion hunts best. Know what I mean? Now, come on. Take you little bite. No. Come on. No. Open B. No. Come on. No. Ernest? No. Ernest? No. Ernest? No. Eddie? It's time for the plane to go to hangar. Just like the movies that still make us laugh over and over again, no matter how many times we see them, we also like characters that do the same thing. Jim Varney made generations of people laugh when he appeared on TV as the lovable goof Ernest P. Worrell for the first time, and then he went on to entertain even more people through films like Ernest Goes to Camp, Ernest Saves Christmas, Goes to Jail, Scared Stupid, Goes to School, In the Army, and many more. John Cherry was there from the very beginning, and he's written a new book about what it was all like. It's called Keeper of the Clown, My Life with Ernest. As a longtime fan of Jim Varney and Ernest, it's a real thrill to talk to John Cherry today. John, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. And, you know, I think the best way to start off everything here is I think just the the fundamental story of how you guys came up with Ernest is a really great story. And for those who possibly don't know about it, uh, could you share a little bit of insight of how it all started? We, we had an ad agency, advertising agency, Carton and Cherry. Yep. And we had this client, uh, Beach Bend Park. And uh, it was an old run-down park, and uh, we couldn't show the park, so we had to talk about the park. So we decided, uh, hey, let's, let's get a guy... Uh, you know, whatever deal you have, he has a better deal. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's annoying. He's just in, he's a guy next door, and he's always in your face about something. Yeah, which we patterned right after my father. So, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I had a, all my life training to develop Ernest. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Ernest was kind of rooted uh, in your father. I I had heard. I thought I had read somewhere, and not that that means anything, but that it was it was also kind of tied to, like, a guy you knew or worked with that seemed to... He worked with my father. Oh, he worked with your father, okay. Yeah, Jim Varney, he had just come back into town, and uh, the actor strike, he'd been out in California to actor strike, and he was broke, and, and I said, here, read this. So uh, that was the first Ernest commercial. We did, uh, we you had him talk to a guy named Vern, basically... Uh, how Vern came about was, uh, I'd like to tell you how smart we were, but <laughs> we didn't have a budget for another actor. Oh, okay. See, that's <laughs> interesting. That was going to be my next question, is how the whole talking to the camera came about, and that makes a lot of sense. And we uh, stick, stuck a 9 millimeter lens on there and stuck it in his face. <laughs> and uh, Jim was right, real comfortable with that. And uh, we shot uh, about six commercials, and they became uh, a real hit, but... Uh, well, uh, uh, let me step back one. Okay. We had on, on our reel, Ernest, from Beach Bend Park, and uh, we put it on the shelf, and uh, the park went broke, and we forgot about it. And uh, one of my clients, a dairy client, uh, Purity Dairies, saw our reel. We had the reel out for some reason, and they said, uh, we like that guy. Let's do a, an Ernest guy. Let's uh, How about a commercial with him? And I said, well, we've already done that. You know, we've already shot the Ernest commercials. We need to do something fresh. And they him and hawed, and finally I said, well, I go to convince them to agree with me. Jim and I went and shot a different character, and I brought it to them, and they said, yeah, that's nice, but we really like that Ernest guy. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, okay, if you insist. And so I called up Jim and said, hey, I talked him into it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> We're going to do Ernest. 
uh, and uh, uh, it became so popular. I put it on the air, and my client uh, called me and said, you've got to do something. People have been uh, calling the station in the dairy, and uh, they're canceling their order, and uh, people are angry about this thing, and they, uh, they don't know where you got this guy. And uh, I thought, gosh, if it's that many complaining, there's got to be somebody that likes it. Yeah. And I went, I went down to the to the TV station uh, here in Nashville, and I said uh, to the people down there, I said, "Have you been getting any uh, calls or any flack because of the, this character that we have in this commercial?" And they went, "Yeah, so much so, people want it so badly that they we had we're running a newspaper ad on the schedule when it's going to be on the air." <laughs> They've got when a commercial is going to run on the air? Yep. Wow. That's got to be the first time in human history that's ever happened. Well, it happened. So I went back to my client and I said, let's just hold off here because we got a lot of pluses. We might have a few minuses, but uh, a few, about a couple of hundred. We've got all these people calling in the TV station wanting to know when it's going to run again. And that's back when they had three, you know, we had three stations. We didn't have a hundred. Right. So one dairy after another... Um, saw the success and this caused a great success for our clients and before we knew it we had like 10, 10 dairies and two convenience stores and four car dealerships and so on and so forth wow and uh let's see that started in 81 and uh, and by the time uh, jim passed away we'd done close to 3,000. wow we had a team of writers and uh, jim was so talented and so quick Boy, he'd make me mad. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't read a script until it was time to do it. He wouldn't uh, prepare what I thought we should be prepared for himself. But he could, he could come in and sit down, take 16 lines of copy, a 30-second spot, and uh, he could read it, sit it down, stand up, and do it. Wow, that's awesome. And not go back to that paper. He could do it. So I guess um, it started off as this little idea, then somebody saw it, they pick it up, it explodes for them, and I guess from there, word just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Next thing you know, you're doing national, and then you're making films. At what point did the two of you realize you had something just really big on your hands with Ernest, and how did Jim react to that? Well, we're kind of slow here in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't catch on until, <laughs> you know, after we sold 10 markets or so, we went, hmm. We ought to syndicate this. Yeah, there's a pattern going uh, here. We had to get beat over the head with it. But we had a lot of good, everybody had a good time. We had a lot of good writers. And after a while, we understood who Ernest was or who he had become. Because he really went through some transitions. And as it, as we worked on it, uh, and more and more and more, it began to crystallize itself into who the character actually was. And amazing, he was a funny guy, too. I mean... Mm-hmm. When we were shooting, uh, Ernest goes to jail. Uh, he's sitting in the uh, jury box there, and he has a pen in his mouth, trying to act like he's in- intelligent. Yep. And it breaks. Yep. It begins to drool all over his face, and I couldn't watch. I had to turn around and not look <laughs> at the monitor or him because I would mess the si- uh, the uh, the take up because I, me and the rest of the crew were laughing. <laughs> I know, that's tough. <laughs> we couldn't get through this. <laughs> well, I would think that uh, that wardrobe, obviously, was, was pretty simple for Ernest. I remember even, I don't remember what I was watching. At one point in time, we literally saw his closet, and it was the T-shirt, the vest, and the hat, just yep. over and over and over. Wide variety of chapeaus. Yeah, right. <laughs> It also made for a uh, an easy Halloween costume. I actually dressed up like Ernest for Halloween one year, and I was at I was at a camp. Was that last year? No, it wasn't last year. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'd do it this year too if I you know if I thought about it. Um, but I was I was a kid and I went to this camp and I knew they were going to have this costume party. It was around Halloween, so uh, yeah, I just had a I got a you know a gray shirt and a vest and a hat, and then I wore a, a big name tag that said Ernest on it. And the only other thing I remember from that dance was I remember almost in kind of in character, I was dancing with a woman dressed as Tammy Faye Baker. So there's a pair for you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That had the same lipstick on. That's right. <laughs> you know, then there were 
um, all the great kind of catchphrases and and things that we got from Ernest, uh, his laugh and the ooh and the know what I mean and things like that. Were these things that just got extra laughs and you guys said, okay, we need to keep doing that? How did some of those very unique staples of Ernest, especially the know what I mean, uh, come around? Well, know what I mean is something that we all say. Yeah. We have turned the, the <laughs> phrase know what I mean into one word. It was already there. It was just sort of pointed out by him. Like I said, I had some writers. We'd have a writing session and be four or five of us. And this is when we're doing the, primarily doing the Saturday morning show. Yep. And uh, he would drop in. Jim never wrote anything down. No, <laughs> unless I never saw him. But he would come in and he would throw things in and he'd get on a roll. And uh, we'd, we'd all put write down notes when he got on a roll because he was really funny. And uh, he would come in and say something like, uh, you know, there ain't no wood in Botswana. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I am a Boswanian lumberjack, and I've never had a job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, the rest of that was, they got wire toothpick, brick telephone poles. And where that came from, I don't know. Yeah, right. And I stuck that in the movie just because I thought it was funny. Fortunately, other people thought it was funny, too. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you... you got the great opportunity to make that jump from TV to the big screen. Can you talk a little bit about the creative process there and what led you to decide that the first story, Ernest, is going to go to camp? Well, it was a budget thing. We could shoot uh, Ernest in, in, in a camp, you know, for, for less money than, than doing outer space or uh, race cars or something. And it, it was more of a um, demographics thing. Uh, a camp with, uh, you know, Meatballs had, had worked and uh, some other camp movies had worked. I was able to sell the, sh- the concept quickly. By, you know, one, they say, uh, boil your pitch down to, to the TV guide. Right. And uh, my pitch was, uh, Ernest wants to be a camp counselor more than anything in the world. He gets his opportunity. They are a bunch of delinquents. Well, Get it. Nice. Uh, your own imagination. Is that a... Is that a uh, platform for a lot of laughs yeah so we had to get a storyline in it there's a an old man he's 100 years old uh, last month uh, that uh saw a lot in me and uh, had a uh helped me out in uh, going to the big screen mm-hmm. uh, his name is elmo williams and he made 52 movies uh the longest day torah 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 blue max uh, the vikings oh uh, yeah Poseidon adventure high noon he really knew how to make movies. He held my hand as I stepped up on the stage. You know, I want you to know that, uh, you know, I love that movie, and Ernest Saves Christmas is actually uh, a big part of my Christmas movie list, you know, to watch every season. And I know other people that are the same way. And, the, you know, not only is um, Ernest Saves Christmas funny, but what also what I love about it is. You know, especially nowadays, it's rare to see a good Christmas movie anymore. And it's even more difficult when you're going to put one together to have a Christmas comedy that also finds a balance between good humor and the spirit of Christmas. And I think you really did that with the with the Christmas story. Well, thank you. One of the fun things, uh, one of the things that happened to us on this, I got my, we were down in Orlando, and my, the reindeer show up. Yeah, except the reindeers don't have any horns. <laughs> and so I forgot about them going, what do they call that, molting or something? Right, yeah. So I called everybody who ever made a Christmas movie, and they said, oh, no, you have to do animatronics. Oh, man. I said, I, I, you know, I, can't, I don't have enough money for a puppet theater, much less animatronics. Right. So we decided to let the runway scene where the sleigh takes off with the reindeer. Um, I had one reindeer that was in felt. So I started the shot with the wide shot and then squeeze it down where you don't see that they don't have horns. Ah, uh, okay. And then I, uh, when you see them later, when they they fly and they stick on the ceiling. Yep. Well, we waited till July when they had horns and uh, came up uh, here in Nashville and painted the floor like the ceiling. Ah, uh, okay. And turned the camera upside down and ran it backwards. <laughs> Whatever you got to do. <laughs> to make it look, and then we go, like, and uh, then they're walking around on the ceiling, and 
that's how we got away with that. Wow. Where there's a will, there's a way, that's for sure. Christmas and then Goes to Jail and then Scared Stupid were also the films where we got to see Jim Varney do some of those other characters impersonations that he did. Um, you know, like the, the the lady in the green dress and uh, all those other impersonations he did. And also we started to see the reoccurring characters uh, like Bobby in those films. Yeah, well, Chuck and Bobby, a Gaylord Sartain playing, uh, who is another hilarious human being. Yeah, I bet he is. He is a good friend and terrific comedian. He, he just acts funny and... Uh, he, he was great help on uh, Ernest Goes to Jail. Uh, if you remember, they, he and Bobby were uh, security guards yep. forever. And uh, uh, I, I got a big kick out of them as well. Those other characters that Jim Varney did, I, I love it in, in uh, Saves Christmas when uh, he dresses up in that big green dress and he walks in and you know is complaining about, you know, she needs help writing her will because after walking there from the airport, she'll be dead soon. And how, you know, wouldn't you know it, she has two sons, one good and one bad, and the good one dies. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Nelda, you know, and her first line was, you work all your life to build you a little place, get a little something for yourself, and what do they do? They move the flipping highway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so many people knew Jim as Ernest P. Worrell, but people really close to him, people like you and many, many of the people he worked with, um, I mean, you've already talked a little bit um, about the great talent that he was, D- despite the fact that he was known for Ernest. I mean, he really was a really good actor who had done Shakespeare and had great versatility in a lot of other areas. Well, yeah, I don't think he got the credit he deserved as far as his skills are. Uh, but every, everybody that worked with him, when we had rehearsals on the pictures, some movie star would show up, uh, somebody that was on the cast, and they'd start out the, well, I, how did, I got a, I'm on an Ernest movie. Oh, man, how, my career's down the toilet. <laughs> uh, they'd stand up, take the sides or script, and they'd start to do a scene with Jim, and they'd stumble, and Jim would pick them up. They'd uh-huh. stumble, and Jim would pick them up. He was so fast, he'd, he'd make, uh, make it look like the other guy didn't make a mistake. That's awesome. That it was part of the script. He was so fast. Well, what made you decide to uh, write the book Keeper of the Clown? Well, I told all the stories about uh, what happened in Africa and what happened in uh, uh, when we made three pictures in Canada and all the different ab- adventures that we uh, opened up to us and the good Lord provided for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, someone said, you know, several people said, well, why don't you write that? Why don't you put it in a book? And... Uh, that sounded like work, actually. <laughs> yeah, right. And it is. <laughs> and it is. So that's what I retired, and I thought, well, I'd, uh, I'll write and see how it comes out. And I think Jim needed some uh, you know, recognition and uh, wrote it for him. That makes sense. Well, and of course, th- there's obviously a lot that fans are going to be able to learn about Jim and about the character and all the great stories that a lot of people have already gotten to hear. It's uh, going to be great to have the opportunity to... Uh, read those stories as well. I, I guess the last thing I, I wanted to ask you about was all of this great history and enduring passion for Ernest has has really got to be still very special to you today. Are you constantly amazed at what it all means to people as you consistently hear from fans? I certainly am. Uh, you know, it's because we have that Ernest moment. All of us have that Ernest moment. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yes. <laughs> I was uh, out in my fishing and i had one of those bluetooth things on yep and a dragonfly landed on my ear and i slapped it and it knocked the bluetooth in the water and i re- leaned over to try to catch it before it sank and my glasses fell out of my pocket <laughs> that's the earnest moment <laughs> that earnest moment <laughs> that needs to but, be your next book all the different earnest moments we'd make a whole library out yeah. of that. <laughs> coke sam's my co- co-writer uh we've been working on son of earnest and uh, well, both of us don't know. You know, we just don't know whether uh, we should do it or... Now, is, or, that a, is that a film? Yeah. Okay, and it's called Son of Ernest? Yep. Okay. We're, we're in the process of developing it. And uh, we look at each other and go, is this working? I don't know. And it, it comes to, you know, who's going to play Ernest? That was the thing I was about to say was, man, I mean, that's redefining the, uh, uh, the whole someone has to be perfect for the role thing, I would think. The best time it works, like the best time it works for all of us, is when we do something stupid 
then we try to cover it up, and it looks more stupid. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all my guys were very experienced at that. Well, we'll keep a lookout to see uh, news on uh, Son of Ernest if that uh, begins to develop for you in the meantime. Um, I want to let everybody know for you know any potential news on that and also a lot of great Ernest features uh, you can find on Hayvern. It's Ernest.com. And that's also where you can find uh, John Cherry's book, uh, Keeper of the Clown, My Life with Ernest. You can get the physical book or you can also get it in an ebook, which is always great. And you've also got a really good active Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Ernest P. Worrell official. If you're a big Jim Farney or Ernest fan or John Cherry fan, you can join a lot of other fans just like you on that site. I've connected with that site as, as well. And it's uh, <laughs> there's a lot of great photos and videos and tributes and all kinds of great stuff on that site. So um, if anything, I'm definitely glad I have found both of those websites. And John Cherry, as a fan, I was very excited when I found out I was going to get to talk to you today. And I really enjoyed our conversation. And as a longtime fan and uh, as a host of the show, I just want to thank you for helping to make Jim Varney and Ernest all that he was and is to us today. And Thanks for being on the show. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. And I'm uh, sure if Jim was with us, uh, uh, he would too. So I'm going to speak for him from heaven. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. That's great because he is missed. That is for sure. Gee, I'm glad it's raining. I hope the morning sun won't come up soon. As long as it keeps raining No one knows my heart broke right in two I thought I had found someone I could count on till the end What they wanted was a hero All I needed was a friend I'm awfully glad it's raining Once we wrapped the interview, John told me um, a little bit about some of the scripts they still have um, from Ernest movies they didn't get a chance to make. And I thought I would share um, with you what he shared with me about what a couple of those scripts were about. Um, one of them was kind of an Ernest Goes to Space sort of deal. <laughs> and it was um, something along the lines of Ernest is working for a toy company and he's driving a truck, uh, delivering toys, and he kind of gets uh, lost or something. Imagine that. Uh, kind of reroutes uh, out into the woods, this little dirt road, and he comes upon this thing laying on the ground that he thinks is a toy robot, but I guess it's a real robot of some sort because when he picks it up, a flying saucer comes over and beams him up. And then it cuts away to a big baseball park, and there's a concert going on. And, of course, the place is full, and the band's on the stage, and then all of a sudden that flying saucer flies over and beams Ernest onto the stage. Ernest thinks he's on Mars, and everybody else thinks it's part of the show. And then he talked about one that starts off um, on a dating show, kind of like uh, the dating game, you know, where you have a bachelorette, and then there's three guys on the other side of a wall, and they all have to answer questions, and she can't see them until she picks uh, which one she wants to go out with. And I guess the third bachelor does not show up. And so they desperately look around to find somebody, and I think you all know who they pick. And I guess Ernest is there either in the audience or uh, working on the set or something, so they stick him on there. And she's asking questions, and Ernest is answering them, only the issue is he's not really actually talking to her. He's talking to the guys in the studio, but she thinks <laughs> that he's talking to her, and she picks him. And as John Cherry put it, uh, they have a mess of a date after that. We obviously would have liked to have seen those, but I think we can definitely be thankful for the ones that we did get to see. <laughs> 